Well, if you would, um, before I begin, what, we're gonna, what we kind of looked at last week is we looked at internal apologetics. And by that, I mean apologetics within the church. And then we looked at external apologetics, defending the Christian faith outside of the church. And then what we looked at, we kind of took a journey with Paul going through the book of Acts. And we, what we saw there is how he addressed the people, who he addressed, and he both addressed the religious people and the non-religious people. Uh, and then we did kind of a Q&A. And so this week, what we're going to be looking at is some different myths. Now, admittedly, in advance, I'm telling you, this is probably going to be one of the most controversial subject matters within apologetics. Um, after going over, you'll know what my position is, <laughs> but I'm telling you this in advance. Um, there are going to be many um, people involved in apologetics that will disagree, and I say that's fine. <laughs> and so we're going to press forward. So what we're going to be looking at this morning is we're going to be looking at the myth of neutrality. We'll be looking at the myth of natural theology, and we're going to be looking at two different types of revelation, both general and special. And then at the end, now I have, now some of this I'll probably go through quickly because I've set aside quite a few questions um, that I think will be very pertinent to what we're looking at. Um, but I think they're also going to be important questions. And so if you have your Bible, if you would turn with me to Matthew 12, Matthew 12, 30. I'll give you just a minute. And as we're going, I'll probably be asking for some volunteers because we have a lot of um, verses we are going to be looking at. So Matthew 12, 30. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. So at the very beginning of this apologetics class, I ask you this question. It does that chapter and verse, does it sound like a neutral position? I, I think that text tells us, no, you're not, you cannot be neutral with Christ, no matter what someone tells you. And so, continuing, I would say that Christians must not set aside their faith commitment, even temporarily in an attempt to approach the unbeliever on what I would call neutral ground. God alone is our starting point. And if we don't start with God, in how, if, if I don't start with God as being the highest source of authority, right, in his word, my question then is, is, would not that be an indicator of idolatry? If I start with another position, seeking to have that position above God, to me, that would be an, a sign of idolatry. I mean, I didn't say we can't point to anything else, but if we point to this being above God, to me, that's a sign of idolatry. David Hume said this. He says, Nothing can be more unphilosophical than to be positive or dogmatic on any subject. And to me, I would say, no, there's a contradiction in itself right there. He is being dogmatic about telling you and I that we can't be dogmatic. And to me, it's a contradiction. Wilson Misner, he says, back in the 1800s, he says, I respect faith, but doubt is what gets you an education. My question to that is, what if you doubt you're going to get an education? So again, another contradiction I say over and over. And so even what the unbeliever demands you to be neutral he is not himself. He is not being neutral. Again, when we, and I contrast that back to Matthew twelve thirty, And so I want to look at relativism in that it teaches that knowledge, truth, and morality are not absolute. So my question, I'm going to direct you now to Psalms 12, 6. So, given this, that relativist teaches that knowledge, truth, and morality are not absolute. God's word says in Psalms 12, 6, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. 
And so even from that, if something is pure, it's, it's not going to be neutral. And so my question is, why must you not attempt neutrality in the use of apologetics? And here's an answer I give. Because, man, because of man's fall into sin, the world is inherently hostile to the Christian faith. And the Christian message confronts the unbeliever as a guilty sinner who is at war with God as his judge. And Romans 1, 18 through 21, teaches us that men are not neutral, but rather actively hostile to God. And that sinners seek to escape the dogmatic truth claims of Scripture by resorting to an alleged claim of neutrality in thought. And so his sinful desire is to be as God, determining good and evil for himself without submitting to God's command. Uh, we see this especially going all the way back to Genesis 3. We, we see this. Satan tempted with Eve about neutrality. And if you would turn with me to Romans 8, 7. Hey, uh, Jason. Yes, go ahead. What? Mm -hmm. Specifically, what I'm referring to is the position that one finds himself before God. I think there are, and there are things we will go over that I think might be neutral, you know, like color or stuff like that. Or, and that's why I want to look at um, kind of neutrality in terms of how it's looked at with God and how it's looked at some other factors. So, and I think filtering that through the lens of biblical language here. And so I think this, um, Romans 8, 7, For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Um, and so going, kind of going through this, we'll, in our questions, we'll kind of go over some examples of neutral questions. And then Hebrews eleven six 6 says, or actually Romans 14, 23 says, Whatever is not from faith, is sin. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And I'd say the phrase skeptics like to use is nobody knows for sure is still not a neutral stance. They're still claiming a dogmatic stance about something. They're making a knowledge claim about something. Even the fact that they believe you can't know anything and yet the scriptures tell us we can. And so neutrality, at least in referencing back to your question, before trying to cast your position before a holy God, and this is what I mean by neutrality. Neutrality is dangerous in the sense that even Satan tempted Eve with this very approach. And I would say because he did so in trying to get to a knowledge of the existence of God. Some people will start well saying, let's be neutral about Jesus. Let's, let's try and find out, you know, is he good, is he bad, did he exist, and so forth. Well, if I don't start with what he said, then in fact, I'm actually going against him. And so that's what I'm talking about. Um, I would say that you cannot defend God and his word, or if you are, if you are not sanctified, set apart for him, by means of contact with his word. And if you have been bought with a price and are a people for God's own possession, how can you set aside God's thoughts as called for him for with the neutrality principle? Because he tells us, we've gone over other scriptures, says you need to set apart Christ in your heart. Well, if you're trying to do that from, and you cannot do that from a position of neutrality. So, Think of an instance, right? We say, here's a question. How can you amen a good sermon in a church and then turn around and play neutral once you're outside of the building? What changed? Was it just your location? We hear Emilio preaching. We're like, yes, that's great. Amen, right? We, amen essentially meaning I believe that, right? We're affirming his position and what he's teaching. We get outside of the church. We go home. We're in a conversation with our neighbor. Our neighbor then says, well, let's just be neutral on all this. Forget what you, this morning, let's just examine it and see if it's right. Well, now we just say men saying we believe all this. And now we're saying, and then this person says, well, just kind of forget that for a moment. 
He's trying to play the neutral ground with us. And so I say, how can we say we affirm all this and now we're willing to say, well, now I'm willing to put it aside. You either believed it or you didn't. And so that's, what, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And so the Christian apologist must know God's word to function properly. The Christian apologist does not set aside Christ from his heart, but rather sets, but sets apart Christ in his heart, and he's sanctified by that. And the scripture for that is 1 Peter 3.15. And so we've kind of looked at, again, the myth of neutrality. And, I, and again, these topics are very exhaustive. And because of our time frame, we're not going to be able to get into all the neutral factors. How do we respond to this question of neutrality and so forth? So we may have time at the end, but I kind of want to go through another myth and then types of revelation. And then, we, and then I'll have questions that will probably get us back to neutrality. And this one is the myth of natural theology. It's also known as philosophical theology or natural religion. It is the practice of philosophy reflecting back on the existence and nature of God, and here's where it's different, independent of divine revelation or scripture. And that's, that's the key factor is being independent of God. It's not a sin to point to something, you know, try and use certain evidences. But when you're doing independent of God, that's when I believe you fall into sin. Um, The realm of natural theology is philosophy, not theology. The source of natural theology is finite and fallen. Human reason and wisdom apart from special revelation or the Spirit's intervention. The Bible and the Holy Spirit, essentially in natural theology, are banished from all dialogue and discussion in the pursuit of truths about God. The claim of natural theology is that by the powers of reason and observation, the human mind can rise to an elementary uh, knowledge of God and basic demands of morality, and they would say unaided by revelation. Kelly James Clark says this, and he is a traditional apologist. He says, we can come to some moral and spiritual truths unaided by the Holy Spirit. And so keep in mind with that, I want to now direct your attention to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14. 1 Corinthians 2, 14. And so now keep in mind what he just says. He says, we can come to a some moral or spiritual truths unaided by the Holy Spirit. So what does scripture say? 1 Corinthians 2, 14. The natural person does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are folly to him, and he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. I, to me, I think that answers that in, in quite the opposite manner. William Lane Craig includes theoretical calculus, secular astrophysics, cosmology, uh, in his definition of natural theology. He kind of appeals to Bain's theorem, um, kind of looks like a calculus chart. I don't recommend it, but if you want to know more, you can Google it. <laughs> um, and I would say that the origins of natural theology go at least back to Plato and Aristotle. I would say they go further back, but that's kind of where, you know, they might have started becoming into a system and talked. Um, some other examples of unbiblical and fallacious assumptions by those who promote natural theology is this. One, they assume that atheists and agnostics are sincere when they claim they do not know if there is a God, whereas the Bible says that the one who says there is no God is a fool. This is told to us in Psalms 14.1. They assume unbelievers do not willfully suppress and reject the truth about God. Romans 1, verses 18 through 31 tells us otherwise. Proponents of natural theology assume efficacious faith can result from natural revelation, whereas the Bible says saving faith results only from special revelation. I think this is demonstrated for us in Romans 10.17 and 1 Peter 1.21. They also assume that unaided human reason is the ultimate authority of determining what is true. If you would, turn in your Bible again to Romans 3, 4. 
Romans 3, 4. By no means let God be true, though everyone a liar, as it is written, though you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. I think, again, going back to if we're going to evaluate truth, we must begin with what God says about truth, not what we think is truth. What does God say about it? Proponents of natural theology assume unbelievers just need more information and more convincing arguments to believe. This was going all the way back in Christ's day when they wanted one thing after another to really test the validity of what he was claiming. They wanted signs, they wanted miracles, they wanted this, and they wanted this. And even Christ said, look, you know, and they were going, and he said, if one even comes from the grave, you know, I would say, in order to have saving faith, that faith is going to have to come from God. It's not going to come from miracles and all this stuff. And so they also, they continue to reject sin's impact on human reasoning. The Bible says that the unbeliever's capacity to reason about spiritual matters is futile and darkened. We learn this from Romans 121. And it continues to talk about their capacity to human re- to reason is foolish and depraved. Romans 128. It literally calls them wicked and untrustworthy. Romans 131. And it calls them dead in their sin. Ephesians 2 1. Calls them ignorant. Ignorant is not stupid. Ignorant is just not knowing. Okay? That is found in Ephesians 4 8. And it is, and they are cal- callous. Ephesians 4 19. And when I say ignorant, I don't mean ignorant about the existence of God. They're ignorant in the sense that they have not believed on God. And they fail to acknowledge God's sovereignty in enabling unbelievers to believe. Let us look to the book of Acts, Acts 16, 14. Acts 16, 14. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Now notice this. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. I think the, the impacting statement here is that the Lord is the one who opened the heart. And, that's, and he is the one that changes thoughts, changes minds. He's the one that literally opens the heart of the unbeliever to believe his truth. And so, they assume that using reason is mutually exclusive from reasoning from the scripture. Let us flip over now, continue, Acts 17.2. Acts 17.2. And Paul went in as his was his custom on the three Sabbath days. He reasoned with them. And the next text tells us, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus, whom I proclaim to you, is the Christ. Now notice, it's not bad to reason with someone. But if we're trying to reason with them, apart from Scripture, claiming that this other objective is higher than Scripture, again, going back to, I believe that's a sign of idolatry. And even Paul reasoned with them from the Scriptures. I think um, some noted other texts, if if you're taking notes and want to learn later, you can look at Job 40, verses 1 and 2, and Hebrews 11, 6. And so now that we've kind of taken a look at what I, again, call the myth of natural theology, I want to get into types of revelation. Um, You might say there's all different types, but again, for time constraint, I really just kind of want to keep it to general and special. And then within special, there's going to be even, I would say, maybe subtypes, but we won't really have time to get into at the moment. Um, So I just kind of want to get into these because I mentioned earlier we do have a lot of questions I do want to go over. But general revelation, it is the self-revelation of God in nature, in providence, and in the moral law within the heart 
and conscious by, whereby all persons have an elementary understanding of God and his moral demands. Now, it is sufficient for providing culpability before God as judge, but insufficient to impart salvation. Okay? We, everyone, has a knowledge of God given from God himself, but that knowledge is not sufficient to save us just by observation. Okay? Richard uh, Main said is this, one's view of general revelation will greatly influence one's apologetic system. And so I would say there's seven key biblical passages that address the issue of general revelation. Uh, we don't have time to get into all of them, but again, these are going to be found in Psalms, 9, Psalms 19, 1 through 6, Ecclesiastes 3, 11, Acts 14, 17, Acts 17, 22 through 31, Romans 1, 18 through 25, Romans 2, 14 through 15, and Romans 10, 8. Uh, Romans 10, verse 18. And so let us look, if, and I may ask for a volunteer to read Psalms 19, 1 through 6. Psalms 19, 1 through 6. Anyone want to read? Go ahead, Josh. As soon as you have it. Yes, sir. The heavens are telling of the glory of God, and their expanse is declaring the work of his hands. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their utterances to the end of the world. In them he has placed a tent for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber. Or coming, out of, yeah, uh, coming out of his chamber. It rejoices as a strong man to run his course. It, its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end of them. And there is nothing hidden from its heat. And so I think with Psalms 19, 1 through 6, informs us of six different insights into general revelation. The first one is the source. The second is its message. And the third point is its never-ceasing cycle of day and night. Four is its character, its silent witness. In five, its extent in the fact that it is observed everywhere. And then in the sixth point is that we see an order of creation. Okay. Uh, you don't have to go there, but Ecclesi actually, let's go also, if I can have a volunteer for Ecclesiastes 3.11. My okay, go ahead. He has made everything appropriate in its time. He has also set eternity in their heart, yet so that man will not find out the work which God has done from the beginning even to the end. And I think this is another thing. Not only is it observed with the natural eye, but that God has placed it in his heart. Mm -hmm. And so he's not, so if a person claims to be, and they may be blind, and so therefore thinking they have an excuse, the fact is that God has also placed it in their heart. So again, they continue to be without excuse. Um, I'll read, uh, uh, if you would, turn to Acts 14, verse 17. Acts fourteen seventeen, Yet he did not leave himself without witness, for he did good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with good, with food and gladness. And I think here the bounty that, call, that comes from God attests to his gracious provision for all who benefit, which includes all of humanity. Um, I think we don't we don't have time, but Acts seventeen twenty two through thirty one. I think again continue to confirm this about the provision of God. Um, and then Romans ten eighteen, the verse echoes the truth, going back to again Psalms nineteen four, and it kind of goes from general to special. Uh, continuing with uh, general revelation. Romans 1, 18 through 25. And we won't read all of it, but from this text, the thrust of this text is that God is angry because of sinful humans have spurred 
God's self-revelation in nature and their resort to idolatry by worshiping created things instead of the creator. It says within Romans 1, 18 through 25, is it says literally, he being God made it evident to them. So my question is, if they are simply without excuse, why would God have wrath if they are simply ignorant of him? He has wrath. He poured it out on his son or he poured it out on the individual. And so the question is, someone simply ignorant, has no knowledge whatsoever of God, why would he have wrath against them? And I believe it is, A, because he has revealed himself to them. It says there, he made it evident to them. Romans 2, verses 14 and 15. I'll go ahead and read it here. Romans 2, 14 and 15. For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves even though they do not have a law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. This illustrates that the conscience is even a gift from God to every human to serve as a moral barometer to distinguish from right and wrong. Even without the privilege of written law, they still have an internal moral code of conduct which they are accountable to. They simply, you know, if we were to say, what does someone look like if they have no idea of right and wrong? Think of any sphere, typically, we, don't, we wouldn't hold them accountable in a court of law. You know, typically what happens is they have no knowledge. If, you, if it's attested that they have no concept of right and wrong, they may not be held guilty. But what would happen is they would probably go into an insane asylum because they cannot distinguish from right and wrong. And so yet I think the scriptures tell us that God himself is revealed not only to the believer but to the unbeliever of right and wrong. So in summary about general revelation, it is a universal awareness of God made apparent in God's creation, external, and the heart and conscience, internal. General revelation is sufficient to condemn the sinner, but insufficient to save the soul. The content of general revelation has been available for all people of all time periods since the beginning of creation. General revelation needs to be interpreted by special revelation. General revelation is suppressed by unbelieving sinners. Any questions? Because next we'll be going into special revelation. Go ahead, Josh. Um, Do you think that there's a different degree of general revelation at all to different maybe social structures or different uh, civilizations? Yeah, I think just like there are degrees of depravity, (laughs) I think there are also degrees of, you might say, conducting yourself not only to a law, let's say, within given by authorities, but within your own internal self. Like, and so is there any benefit to them? Well, in one sense, there is a benefit. I think Charles Spurgeon said, you know, observing the law may keep you out of jail, right? But it won't keep you out of hell. So for my neighbor has a law, right? He lives in Texas, so he, he's appealing to a Texas law. So he can see this law, he knows what it is, he's going to observe it. Therefore, the benefit to him, obviously, is not salvation. But he may not go to jail, and if he does all these good things, there may be certain benefits even to that. And I mean, and I even benefit by him observing the law, right? And what that would look like, he knows, right, I'm his neighbor. Not only, let's say, he knows, let's say we're not living in Texas, but let's say, you know, maybe a a tribe or whatever that doesn't have a law against stealing, Mm -hmm. right? And so he would benefit by not only the written law of it, or let's say I would benefit Mm -hmm. by it, not only the written law against everyone there, Mm -hmm. but the internal law, he would know it's wrong to steal. Therefore, I benefit even from him not stealing against me. Because I was was wondering that because the conscience thing, Mm -hmm. it seems like there can be a collective declaration that's making people more sensitive to conscience. 
Sure. Rather than, you know what I mean, even though they're holy. Right? To me, I would see that is even a, what we call a passive hardening of the heart. God removing that. And so what, in the, so the cause then is in being even hardened, even more and more hardened. Which would then turn into, you know, they can end up, you know, I, here you might say jail, print, you know, just more and more stuff that goes actually against them. Any other questions? No? That's good? So special revelation. Is God's disclosure of himself in salvation history? Revelation in reality. And the imperative word of scripture. Revelation in word. Specific people at particular times and places given further understanding of God's character and a knowledge of his saving purposes in his son. The Holy Spirit has a direct role in the agency of special revelation. And so the need for special revelation arose because of the fall. And you see this through Genesis 3, verses 6 and 7. And the curse upon sinful humanity, Genesis 3, 14 through 19. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they enjoyed direct, immediate, ongoing, personal interaction with God. We see this in Genesis 2, verses 7 and 8. But after the fall, humans would have access to general revelation, but would willfully suppress it because of sin. We, again, we see that in Romans 1, 18 and 19. Hence, there was the need for God to intervene with special revelation to redeem sinful humanity. In history, I want to quickly just kind of go look at the history of special revelation. With the coming of Christ came the fullest source of special revelation ever imparted to the world. We see this in John 1.14, 1.16, and Colossians 1.19. Uh, God imparted special revelation going all the way back to 4000 BC to Adam, Genesis 2.16. He declared it to Cain, to Noah. He went, and we see this uh, through the patriarchal period of 2200 to 1900 BC. We see it to Abram, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. We see it given to Moses, Joshua, to Samuel, David, sons of Korah. We've seen it through the minor and major prophets. And then we see it going again to the birth of Christ in Luke 1 and 2. And so, and then we're continuing the ministry of Jesus to the apostle. And so, if I may have another volunteer, and we're going to read Psalm 19, verse 7 through 11. I'll go ahead and read it. Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the, wor- of the law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even so much fine gold. Sweet also, sweeter than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. And so with Psalm 19, 7 through 11, God's special revelation as found in the text is described using six different monikers and these are the law the testimony the precepts the commandment the fear and the judgments and each specific name highlights a different efficacious element inherent in inspired scripture the main truth from these verses is that special revelation is superior to general revelation scripture has the inherent power for restoring the soul 19.7. God uses biblical truth to regenerate and save people. To acquire saving faith, a sinner needs the input of special revelation. This was true of Abram, who when, and this you can go flip over to Genesis 15.4. It says, this was true of Abram, who when the word of the Lord came to him, he then believed in the Lord. 
and he, being God, reckoned it to him as righteous. Genesis 15, 6. And then God saved Abram through the medium of special revelation. And so it is why it is so important to use scripture when doing apologetics. And I'd say the New Testament teaches the same thing, declaring that you have been born again through the living and abiding word of God. This you can see in 1 Peter 1, 23. Faith comes from hearing, and it comes through hearing the word of Christ. Romans 10, 17. Faith does not come from general revelation. It doesn't come from natural theology or laws of logic or persuasive speech or human wisdom. And a quote from Clifford McManus, we need a revolution in Christian apologetics and it needs to start with putting the word of God back in its rightful place. Now all of this, I also want to say that special revelation does not always lead to saving faith. You can have something revealed to you You can even have the scriptures revealed to you, and it doesn't mean you're going to be saved. The Bible is special revelation, but historically special revelation included more than the Bible. Even Jesus spoke direct special revelation that was not in the context of scripture. If you go, and I learned that from Jesus when he says, not all of my words are going to be within the scope of the Bible. If it did, we'd have a very large Bible. (laughs) Um, Now, while the Bible is sufficient, it is not exhaustive of every word of God. So it is profitable. Every word is profitable for our life, but not every word that's ever been spoken by God is going to be here. Okay? And so with our time, I have several questions, and I'm hoping... um, to get to a good portion of um, a friend of mine, or more of an acquaintance, who claims to have been a Christian. He grew up Church of Christ. He now has run from it <laughs> and admits it. And while he, on the surface level, is a very friendly, nice guy, he's not, he does not have a mean demeanor, he still admittedly hates Christianity. It's not even just like, I don't want anything to do. And so much that he's written blogs of, um, why he hates Christianity. And some of the, and one of the blogs, I even told him if he didn't mind, I would do this. And one of his blogs was 70 reasons why I am so angry, essentially, at Christians. And so what I want to do um, at the end portion of some of these questions is just go over some of his statements and then say, how should we respond to someone like this? Because I think there's a lot of people that are angry. They may not always admit it, but they are. Um, But before we do that, I also want to look at... um, One of the questions is this. What is the difference between neutral ground and common ground? Again, we just kind of went over not being neutral with God. But can we use any common ground with someone? And if so, what would be some examples of that? Well, maybe like culture. Mm-hmm. I think of Jesus with the woman at the well. I mean, just he appealed to a, uh, you know, to a uh, landmark. You know, as an example. Sure. To, you know, kind of segue into spiritual things and appeal to everyday life. Sure. Know? And um, I think that's <clears throat> kind of something we can do. We can start talking to you about sports. Sure. Especially if they're Laker fans, you know, I can talk to them. They need to be safe, I right? Is that? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think. Um, being at <laughs> right. I think even something, even an unbeliever with a, a believer, they have gone through trials. They've gone through death. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but um, Kate Craddock just like died. You know, and so we can, we can talk about believers as well as unbelievers go through death. We can talk uh, births, marriages, all these factors we can talk about. And I think we should talk about them, even with the unbeliever. These are things that we're going to have in common ground with. Now, the difference, though, might be in our motive. What drives me to do this? What, what is the, what, um, you might say, does the indicative drive the imperative? What would, as a Christian, what would be my motivating factor for these things that I'm doing? Uh, and so that, that being said, 
My question is, describe an action in which the same action was done by an unbeliever and a believer. Is that action itself neutral? Here would be an example. I don't purposely partner with an unbeliever, right? Um, but let's say I'm driving a car. He's driving a car. I don't, I don't even know who he is. Traffic accident. We both see someone trying to escape out of a burning car. Both of us driven, you know, we try and get up and go and save this person literally from a, a burning car. Now, so the question then is we're doing it pretty much the exact same thing. Is, are we, is this action neutral? No. Okay. I'm not just going to say, well, why, why you say no? Well, he might be doing it because, I mean, it's a, it's a, it were to be God-centered as Christians, and so you're saying, one, that person, you, I'm assuming, I'm presupposing that that person is made in the image of God. It's your duty as a Christian to have a concern for those per, that, that person. I agree. To sure. Do, you know, what you can. And not to mention, you don't know if they're saved or unsaved. You might spare them from, uh, you know, missing out on an opportunity for the gospel or uh, hellfire, even though you know your your soul is in a good place. You know, mm -hmm. so you're you're more willing to risk your life than theirs. But the unbeliever, they could be doing it for an egocentric person purpose. They could be doing it for monetary reward. They could be doing it for uh, recognition from their fellow man. They don't necessarily have the same presuppositions that you do that have been implanted by specific revelation to do those things. Do you have something, Scott? Or well, I don't know. It, sometimes the things happen so fast that you could both value life. Sure. Without necessarily having the neutrality of why you value that life. I don't know if that makes sense. Because things like that happen so fast. I don't know how much actually goes through your head, but we value life because God has saved us. And you know... Um, it just gives it a whole different perspective to why we value life, and it doesn't change the fact that there's a commonality there. I think his ultimate worldview, you know, as an unbeliever, you save someone's life, you do it for what end? Mm -hmm. You know, why do you value life? Well, it's certainly not because you believe in God's image in that person. You know, maybe you do it for moralistic reasons, sure. not for religious reasons. So there would be a different than motive. Right, and I think, to me, that General is the key word is motive. Um, like what Scott's saying, you know, being a Christian, while we should do everything for the glory of God, I may not necessarily think at that very moment when something has to be done in a split second, how will getting out of the car bring glory to the car? Should I walk fast? Should I, you know, all these things. So, but because I'm a Christian, I'm just, I like, I say there's worth in this person and value, not because of in and of themselves, but because they are made in the likeness of God. And so that's my motive. You know, obviously I see him as a fellow human being that would go back onto common ground. And because I believe, you know, God has called us to care for people. And so now, can this other pe person, they may have no other motive other than they also would say this person's a fellow human being. And I would say going back to God has put it in their heart, though, that they ought to value him. Even if, you know, they would, if you ask someone, do you think there's inherent worth or value in a person? Inherently, I'd probably say no. Now, they may say yes. I'd say that inherent would come from God. And so that might be what would drive them to do something. And that's so I think I the biggest difference would be motive. Well, I, that's what I was trying to say. The one, the effects of general revelation on motivation right. versus specific revelation on motivation. You may still have all They're the both bases, from God. Both from God, still saying the same basis of general revelation on both people. But one has been granted spe special revelation that has had has been acted upon. So you have the foundations the same, the common ground, and mm -hmm. the general revelation, like the rain falls on the just and the unjust alike. You know, but then you have the specific revelation has that has taken roots in the heart of those that are regenerate. Sure. This being said, along with the idea of um, neutrality, take any subject and, and you can apply it the same way. But I'm going to use this word. Is science neutral? Why or why not? It's not neutral because one, uh, the processes by which they say it's empirical evidences uh, doesn't doesn't take away the presupposition and assumptions they're going to have on what that empirical evidence is doing. So I would say 
that the presuppositions can drive the science that is discovered. Okay. Um, I would say this science by itself is not going to exist. And so science, if you go back to the definition, which is pretty much agreed on, upon most people, is a methodology in which to discover data. Yeah. And so what drives how, you know, but we always assume that, you know, it's trying to provide empirical evidence for this, but there's all different types of sciences. There's fire science, you know, study of the mind. You know, me and an unbeliever can use the same methodology in discovering how does fire start? You know, how do I put it out? What are these different factors? Um, so is it neutral or not? I, I don't think the methodness, I think the people <laughs> wouldn't be neutral. Right. The method might be. Go ahead, sir. It's kind of like math. But even math, I think, would have absolutes, <laughs> and they would agree with that. But, but it would be the application that sure. would be not neutral. Right. And how you view this, but it's the same thing with science. Well, and the reason why I bring up science, because so often people look at it as science versus God, right? Yeah. Science yeah. versus, and I would say it's never, I never want to get on our own streets and say, you know, well, it's, you know, it's, Science versus God, any of that. No, to me, what I wanted, I might view it as good science, a good methodology in which to discover something against a bad method. <laughs> so when someone says science says, well, I think they've lost the argument right there because science itself says nothing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's people who say it's, something. It's man interpreting science. Right. A method in which they use. Because what is science? I mean, it doesn't have a, a physical voice, so it doesn't actually really say anything. So if they're wanting empirical evidence, then they have to prove that <laughs> right there, that science actually would say anything. Um, tell you what, I'm going to skip some of the questions. Well, I'm going to get to this one and see if we have some other, uh, how to answer someone who's angry. And that is this. What is the difference between an atheist and an agnostic? And then with that is going to be a follow-up question. Go ahead, sir. Well, an agnostic would say that you can't know God. You can't know whether God exists or whether he does or doesn't exist. Whereas an atheist would make the declaration that he does not exist for sure. Sure. Agnostic really comes from the word just uh, not knowing. Mm -hmm. You know, I can be agnostic about a lot of subjects. Um, it would be kind of being ignorant of, of God. They say, I don't know if God, I'm not willing to say he doesn't exist. Um, an atheist would be more militant and say there is no God. Now, when an agnostic, though, says, I'm just not sure if God exists, right? The question then is, do you think he is honest in his claim? Why or why not? No. I mean, I certainly don't think an atheist is, but is an agnostic. As an agnostic, he's not being honest either. Okay. I agree with you. I'm just, yeah. why would you say that? And it's because of Romans 1 says that God has made it evident to him. He's just suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. What is uh, probing his conscience is, is what God has put in him to know that the heavens are telling him the glory of God. Mm -hmm. And for him to make that presupposition, he's suppressing that truth, saying that he's not sure. Okay. Um, we only have one minute, so I, what I'm going to do, rather than ask these questions, what I will ask them. At this point, I'm not looking for a response. I just, went, as you leave, I want you to be aware of these questions and think about how you might respond to them with the last minute that we have. Is, uh, and these are just uh, some, he went at 70 reasons why I'm so angry. I'm just going to list a real quick few. Uh, I am angry that according to uh, recent studies, atheists are more distrusted in society than the worst kinds of criminals. I am angry that churches say, homosexuality is a sin and yet say that that type of teaching does not lead to suicide. I am angry that the Bible says, spare the rod, spoil the child, and yet this type of teaching leads to child abuse. I am angry that the church gives the Bible to drug addicts as if that were the only answer. I am angry that Christianity defines the entire worth of other people based on whether or not they believe the more fanciful stories out of the Bible. I am angry at the fact that 40% of Americans simply will not vote for an atheist simply because he is an atheist. 
I am angry that the Christian encourages people to rejoice in their suffering, often making them feel guilty over deep pain. Um, I am angry because religion somehow got attached to denying women the right to pro- pro- reproductive health. I am angry that the military is full of religious chaplains, but literally bars atheists from the job position. And so those are just certain <laughs> reasons that this, there's a lot of them um, to, to, go, to think about. How would you respond to someone like this? Yeah. Yeah. What you say? Go ahead, Scott. Just creating excuses. Yeah, he's just the real reason why he's yeah. angry. Yeah. If you press him on those issues, and he probably doesn't even know anybody that's become a, a subject of child abuse for using those. You know what I'm saying? He may or may not, but it sounds like he's just coming up with a list to suppress the reason why he's really angry at God, or maybe a personal hurt. But that's what I would try and get around that a little bit, mm-hmm. and try to dig deeper into why he was really angry. Because, like these guys said, I think a lot of those are just the smoke, just smoke exactly. Sure. Yeah. Well, and that's why I wanted to provide him to, to think about ahead of time. How are you going to respond? Someone says, you're right, I am angry because of this. Um, and then he also gave, and we, we don't have time now, but also he also gave 21 reasons why he, as an unbeliever, actually does go to church. And so we'll go over that next week. <laughs>